Yeah, what was uh, student life like at Hamilton then? Well, it was an all-male college, <clears throat> um, which by definition means there were no women. It's now co-ed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as much as I loved the school, and I did like it very, very much, I think it's a much better place even, it's, it's even better now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, every, uh, there were things that happened that didn't bother me at the time that should have and do now. Uh, there, there were, the basic social units were fraternities. And I think over 90% of the students uh, was in a fraternity. What didn't trouble me at the time and should have and does trouble me now, what about the other five to ten percent, whatever the number was. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but that, that was it. You, know, you went you got up, you went to class uh, and I, uh, I had I waited on table in, in a fraternity, and then I had a, a job driving a milk truck for a dairy, which mm. was, uh, that was a good experience too. Uh, and the dairy was on, on the far edge of the, of the college campus, and I delivered to, I don't know, I'll, I'll say 10 of the, whatever number it was of the fraternities. Mm. Which fraternity were you in? It was called Psi Upsilon, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I th Hamilton no longer, I guess they still do have fraternities, but the whole s social complex is different. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're not, not the entities they used to be at all. Mm -hmm. And I know the fraternity house is now, a, I think it's now a dormitory. Mm -hmm. I, I lived the last three years in the, in the uh, home of the secretary of the college who traveled a lot. He was sort of at that time the alumni contact and he wanted somebody in the house while he was away. So I, I got fr I, free, uh, a free room by staying there. So um, uh, during the summers you were working at this camp? Still, or, or I did for the first yeah. first summer. Then I taught uh, tennis down here at what is it, the Morristown Field Club. Mm -hmm. I I was the pro, and I I couldn't hold a candle to the the pros they've had in recent years. <laughs> but I I did that for one summer, <clears throat> and then oh this is a major event. At the end of my. By the time I finished my junior year of college, I had everything in place financially for my senior year. I was the steward of the fraternity, so I had free board. I was living with the secretary of the college, so I had free room. I had a scholarship that paid my tuition, and I had the dairy, which gave me spending money. And I, I realized there had to be more to life than work. Mm -hmm. So I, <clears throat> I went to one of the professors who was a Quaker, and uh, he, I s asked him if he had any ideas of what I might do with the summer. And he said, he said, why don't you uh, sign up for one of these American Friends Service Committee work camps, a Quaker work camp, which I did. And I went with two other people, uh, two other students from Hamilton. We flew out to, I'm sorry, we drove out and camped out going across country to California, flew down to Mexico, which is where we were assigned, and they had a conference for all the people in the program at the beginning in a place in Cuernavaca called Los Canarios Motel. Mm -hmm. And that's where we met. And that's where I met the woman who became my wife. Oh. Uh, Where was she from? She was from, well, her family moved a great deal, but their primary residence was Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, and she had gone to a Quaker boarding school, the George School, which is across the Delaware River 
in, I think it's in Newtown, Pennsylvania. But what happened was I had bumped into a fella from Mexico and somehow racket sports came up. <clears throat> and he said, we, we don't, do you want to play a game? I think it was called tennis frontone or something like that. It was like handball, only, <clears throat> only you played it with a tennis racket against a backboard. Mm -hmm. And at that time, and I'm, I'm not so sure I've ever improved, I had a short attention span for meetings. And I got up to leave to go play this game with him. Turns out that Penny suffered from the same deficiency, and she was going swimming. And she walked by in a black bathing suit, and I was sunk. <laughs> That's what happened. So, um, was there a comp? You said there was a conference. Was there like a work project after that, or <laughs> there was? What did you do? I, I had <clears throat> uh, my. I I went out to one camp. Penny went to another, and I had <laughs> the weighty responsibility of digging latrines. We were, I was out in a little mountain village, and there was one stream about so wide that came through the town from down the mountain. And that was the one you drank out of, you bathed in, and didn't relieve human waste in. And we were trying to show them the benefits of modern sanitation, uh, which involved <laughs> my digging privies. And that's mm. what I did. Mm. Oh. Um, so, uh, how, how did you, uh, you know, keep in touch with your wife after that, being? Uh, from different areas? Was it all through a letter? Or, uh, well, yeah, that, uh, what happened, we, she started off in college. I went back to my senior year at Hamilton. She was starting at Mount Holyoke. And uh, in January, one of my good friends, a fellow who was with me on the honor court, said he was, he had a date with a girl from Mount Holyoke that I want to go over with him. And uh, I remembered Penny, so I got in touch with her, and we we set it up and had a date. Hmm. And we went to one of those uh, New England roadhouses where you danced to a jukebox, ate pizza, and drank beer. <laughs> um, were you involved in the, with the uh, tennis team at Hamilton? I was. Yeah. Um, and I, during, I started off my freshman year. My sophomore and junior year, I really didn't have time for it. Uh, my senior year, by that time, I had, as I said, everything's pretty well organized. So I went out and played on it again. We had a good team uh, for that league. Uh, Who would you uh, play against? <clears throat> oh, we played Hobart. I think we played what pretty much were the NESCAC, what is now the NESCAC schools. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, and then I, I've had kids, and grandchildren, <clears throat> uh, and, and others, and children go to Hamilton and, and also go to some of the other NESCAC schools, like Williams, for instance. <clears throat> but we played Cortland State. They had a good team. I think Alfred we played, <clears throat> Rochester, mm -hmm. so forth. I'm also curious because uh, interviewing uh, other folks who graduate around the same time at different schools around the, the Northeast, um, I know uh, McCarthyism sometimes comes up in different yes. contexts. What, do, any memories of, of that's impact on the campus or your thoughts? Yeah, what or? I do. <laughs> What I do remember was the speaker at our commencement was Edward R. Murrow, mm. who had taken on McCarthy. And I was the president of my class, so I was given the responsibility of escorting Edward R. Murrow around the campus on the Sunday morning before commencement. And uh, I was so ill-informed, I'm sure he came away wondering 
what the devil did they do at this college anyway? But it was quite an experience to, to escort him around. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he really was a hero. He was, he was something. Mm -hmm. Because there were, there were not, not a lot of people willing to take McCarthy on at the peak of his power, but Murrow was one who did. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So you um, uh, tell me a little bit about being the class president. What, what did that entail? And it, it was virtually nothing. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I, I was also the, as I say, chairman of the honor court, and I was chairman of the chapel board. Hmm. Which, if I were to do it over again, I would do fewer things hmm. and focus more on the academic side of life. What did the chapel board do? Um, we invited in speakers, and uh, I, I don't think we did very much at all. Uh, but the uh, it was there to to coordinate the, the uh, activities that, between the chapel and the students. Mm -hmm. <coughs> do any of the speakers that came through uh, stand out in your memory? Oh, there was, a, there was one, I wish I could think of his name, he, uh, uh, he came up from uh, a divinity school, actually a Union Theological Divinity School, and he was terrific. And uh, actually, I, I actually went down there for an inter spend a weekend uh, my senior year when I wasn't sure what I was going to do and I decided that that was not the life for me. I, th I thought it would be too restrictive among other things. Ended up doing something even more restrictive than being, <laughs> being a minister. Um, so you went to NYU after graduating from Hamilton. How did uh, that opportunity come about? Well, they had a, <clears throat> they, they had, there was a competition for the, for the scholarships, and uh, I remember, uh, there, there were 10, 20 scholarships, two from each of the 10 federal circuits. Um, and um, I, being from New Jersey, I was in the third circuit. Uh, and so I came th through the interviewing process in New Jersey, uh, was chosen to be one of the people representing New Jersey at the finals down in Philadelphia. And uh, <laughs> I remember at the, at the final interview, the, I had typed my uh, application myself. I was not then and am not now a terrific typist. Of course, in those days, you didn't have computers. And when you typed, you were typing the final copy. So my, co <laughs> my application had a lot of erasures on it. And I remember one of the men participating in the judging <laughs> said, how do you explain this slovenly job of typing? And operating on the premise that if all else fails, tell the truth, I said, I did it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to fall out of his chair laughing. <laughs> uh, so I got the scholarship, went to law school, and the, uh, uh, and, and, and I, I, I was able to, de I developed a long-standing relationship with the law school. I've been on their board a long time, uh, now, so long that I'm now an emeritus trustee, which means I don't do anything. Um, but I also was on the board of the Institute of Judicial Administration there, and they were kind enough to invite me back to speak occasionally. Um, and that, that law school has, uh, it's probably the biggest success story in legal education in the last 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> and, and folks in New Jersey might be interested in this, that 
I think the motive, the, the prime mover behind taking NYU from essentially a New York City law school and converting it into a national law school was a man named Arthur T. Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt was a New Jersey lawyer. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> he had taught there in the evenings for many years. He, in New Jersey history, uh, he is one of the dominant, if not the dominant figure. Uh, he was an eminently successful lawyer. He was the head of the Republican Party in Essex County at a time when that was the dominant county in the state, certainly in Republican politics. He was the dean of the law school at NYU. He was the president of the American Bar Association. And it was he who looked at the New Jersey court system and, and others, saw that it was it's, it, a terrible system. There were multiple courts, uh, and it was a very inefficient system. And Vanderbilt <clears throat> got the got the idea that there should be a unified court system. And as many people have said, he took the worst court system in the United States and converted it into the best. And it was a long, hard road. He he said that. Uh, judicial reform is not for the short-winded. And he tried through the 30s and 40s to get a new constitution with a new court system. Finally, uh, in the 1940s, after a couple of failed efforts, uh, he and Arthur, Alfred Driscoll uh, were able to get a new constitution through. And Driscoll ran for governor, and uh, he and Vanderbilt, they had a, had a falling out at one point, but they, they worked together to get this new system through. So Vanderbilt, while he was doing that, he was also, he had uh, uh, wanting to uh, vastly improve New York University. And he started a major fundraising and uh, raised the funds for the for the law school building, which is still there today and appropriately is known as Vanderbilt Hall. Uh, and he uh, he he really was the w one who he he saw that the, for law for the law school to achieve greatness, it had to improve its student body and improve its faculty. And that's taking nothing away from the students and faculty who were there, but the, he, he saw in order to meet the criteria by which people judge as law school, there had to be change. <clears throat> so he founded this scholarship plan. And uh, he, the law school has, has been blessed with a series of positively superb deans since then and is today uh, variously rated as one of the top ten or top five law schools in the country. Mm. And uh, uh, he, he deserves a lot of credit for that. Mm. When I left law school, uh, I went with his former law firm here in New Jersey, and uh, his two twin sons were there, Bill and Bob Vanderbilt, both of whom have just since died. Um, I was curious, I want to ask more about that later, but because um, Vanderbilt and his ideals will come up a number of times in this interview, I'm sure. Uh, but did you ever actually get to meet uh, the justice? I, I did. He was a tough old bird. I mean, uh, uh, he came over and s spoke to those of us on the scholarship plan. And we had worked very hard to preparing for and taking our exams. And his opening line and his remarks to us uh, were, well, I've looked at how you've done, and life must be pretty easy over here. <laughs> but that's, that, that's just who he was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me about that first year in law school, what, what that adjustment was like, and what, 
you recall of the courses well, and professors? Uh, well, those of us on the scholarship plan lived together. And uh, I lived at a building that no longer exists called 50 Sullivan Street. I did something that no law student should ever do, and certainly no first-year law student. Uh, in the summer between graduating from college and starting law school, that's when I fell in love with Penny Morrow. That's not a good thing to do when you're a law student. Uh, the, uh, uh, but we, we lived together. They had special programs for us. In terms of the professors, uh, one of the really good ones was a fellow named Robert Leflar, who uh, had been the dean at the University of Arkansas Law School. Ha and, uh, but I can pretty much recall all of them. Uh, there was one, Delmar Carlin taught procedure. Professor Simpson taught, taught contracts. And Elmer Million, who was probably the best teacher uh, taught property. Uh, they, it, it, yeah, you had to you had to crank up a few notches, but I, I was fortunate enough to do well enough to come back the next year. Mm. How competitive uh, was the school then, uh, particularly among the uh, scholarship recipients? Pretty competitive. Mm. Uh, pretty competitive. Uh, and I think I, w one of the great things that's happened, not only at that law school, but at other law schools as well, is that there is the, the relationship between the faculty and the students has changed. And the faculty is much more open to students, much more amenable uh, to, to students. Uh, and, when I went there, uh, there was sort of an antagonistic relationship between the faculty and the students. I mean, I, I know I have several, uh, I have children, grandchildren who are lawyers, and they've had a very different experience, and that's a good thing. Uh, Did you have to work while you were in law school? I fell into a... Uh, no, I, I fell into a sinecure in in in, uh, in my uh, in my second year, taking attendance in the evening school. But I didn't have to. That was just it was just something that I, that I did. Uh, any memories of your? Because you said you were living with the other scholarship right. students. Any memories of that little cohort within the school? Well, unfortunately, the, my first year roommate has since died, and as has one, uh, one of my second year roommates. Uh, my third year, by the my third year, Penny and I were married, and we, we lived in, in a trailer in Bayonne, New Jersey. Mm. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting features the second year was that every person on the Root Tilden program would live with a, uh, a student on the Inter from the Inter-American Institute. The Inter-American Institute brought students in from Central and South America, many of whom were already lawyers in their countries. But the idea was to give us a broader perspective on the world <coughs> and introduce us to folks whom we wouldn't ordinarily meet. And I, I did that. I had two roommates my second year. Uh, one fellow was a lawyer, uh, became, became a lawyer, and now lives in New Zealand. The other, who was Luis Super Viel, who was on the Inter American Institute uh, program, uh, he unfortunately has died. Hmm. So was there a particular aspect of the law that uh, you enjoyed or really found fascinating? You know, there really wasn't. In fact, when I graduated, I'm, I wasn't sure I wanted to practice law. Uh, I didn't know whether to go to graduate school. I, I wasn't quite sure. 
and uh, I was uh, a lot of good things have happened to me. One of the good things was going to work at Toner, Crowley, Walper, and Vanderbilt. In those days, you had to clerk for nine months uh, before you could take the bar, mm. and um, so I did. I had to clerk nine months. It was a terrible system. Uh, it was a way of getting uh, young lawyers for very little pay. Uh, but there was a, there was a wonderful group of people in that firm uh, who, who were extremely nice to me. Uh, Willard Walper, uh, I, I recall. Uh, Bill Vanderbilt. Um, after I passed the bar, I remember I was sitting in the library doing research because that's really all I did as a clerk and in, then as an associate. Uh, Bill uh, came in and, and I, I asked him, I said, how long do you think it will be before I get to try a case? And he said, do you mean in the Superior Court or the U.S. District Court? And I said, yes. He said, probably seven or eight years, which sounded like an awfully long time to me. <clears throat> and Bill kindly, Bill was in the New Jersey Assembly at the time, and he, I said, he said, look, let me call Chet Weidenburner, the U.S. Attorney, see if they're hiring. So he did, and uh, I went down, had an interview with Chet Weidenburner. He offered me a job, and so a couple of months later, I started down at the U.S. Attorney's Office, which was a terrific experience. Mm. So um, you started there in '58. So I, I started. I, I tried. No, I started. Graduated in '57. Couldn't take the bar until '58, and then I took the bar in either June or July. Was sworn in in August. And then in October, I went down to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. And w where was that located? Right uh, in, well, in those days, it was in the U.S. Courthouse in Newark. Now, I think there's a whole, there's a whole separate building. It's, and the office is much more sophisticated than today than we were. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that was an experience where you you get thrown into the deep end, and either you swim or sink. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember I hadn't, I hadn't been there only a couple of weeks when one of my predecessor's cases was on for trial. I had never argued a motion, taken a deposition, tried a case. And we went in ahead of time to meet with the judge and my adversary. <laughs> I thought they ought to know what a treat they were in store for. <clears throat> so I said, Judge, I said, there's something I got to tell you. And he said, what's that? I said, I've never tried a case before. No, I, I said to him, I've never been in court before. He said, oh, what you mean is you've never tried a jury case in federal courts. I said, no, what I mean is I've never been in court before. And he, he looked on me with pity and said, well, I have. <laughs> so we went forward and everybody survived. Uh, what kind of cases would you be working on in that position? Civil. Okay. I, I was in the civil division, and they were everything. I ha we had uh, cases. Uh, I remember an injunction case uh, involving a uh, plant down in central New Jersey that was using a heat sealing device. Uh, that was radiating on the same frequency as the communication tower from the Colts Neck Airport, mm. and it was fouling up the airplanes coming in, so we had to go get that shut down. Uh, had an immigration case, tort cases, contract cases, the whole, it was pretty much the gamut. I was, I w was thinking about shifting over to the criminal division when Penny became pregnant with our first child, and I thought I ought to start 
in private practice and uh, start making a, a better living. Mm. Mm. Well, um, any of those cases, uh, experiences with those cases stand out in your memory before we go well, into private I, I, practice? Let me see. What stands out is my relationship with the judges. Uh, they were terrific. Uh, after I'd been there for a while, <coughs> uh, at least in those days, uh, they got to know the lawyers, and I'm sure it's true today. And they got, and the, I, I had a wonderful experience. And the, the chief judge was a man named, and the initial chief judge was William Smith. And for some reason, he took an interest in me. And I remember uh, one day he called me up and he said, Stuart, I want you to come down and see what's going on. There was a lawyer, uh, he was a legendary trial lawyer in New Jersey at that time, John McGeehan. He was a big, handsome Irishman with a terrific voice and extraordinarily talented. And Judge Smith said, he said, I'm not running the courtroom, he is. Well, believe me, nobody ran Judge Smith's courtroom but Judge Smith. Anyway, I went down and saw John McGee in action, and I, that, was, that was a nice thing for Judge Smith to do. Uh, and and I, I remember when I decided to leave to come to private practice, uh, with Judge Mendon Morrill, who curiously had been involved in the, Mac in the, the Mahir, uh, McCarthy Army hearings down in Trenton, uh, on the good side, and uh, he, he very nicely said to me, uh, Stuart, he said, I'll give you a piece of advice. He said, you're going out to the suburbs to practice. He said, in addition to trial work, you're going to have to do real estate closings. He said, at your first closing, bring a pocket full of change. The other side's going to question how you've computed taxes put the change on the table and tell them to take what they want. <laughs> but that was the sort of relationship you could develop with, with the judges down there. Mm. Well, how did you um, uh, get settled into your private practice here? Uh, it, well, you joined a firm, right? You, yeah. You know. What happened was um, I was getting to the point where I realized I, I really, now that I had a, a wife and a child, I started to have to make a living. And just coincidentally, uh, a fellow, Cliff Starrett, uh, who is now deceased, who had gone through the Rue Tilden program ahead of me, called me up and said, look, we need a trial lawyer. Uh, would you like to come out and talk about joining the firm? So I, I re on those days, Newark was the legal and financial center, and I had always just assumed I would practice in Newark. <clears throat> and, uh, but I came out, and uh, the name of the firm was Skank Price, Smith and & King, and, and in those days it was Skank, Smith & King, because Judge Price was still a judge. Anyway, I came out, had an interview, and uh, like them, it was, and and so I, I uh, and uh, that's where I, I went and where I started. What no, what I couldn't have anticipated was that in a very short period of time, uh, law firms, major law firms such as Riker Danzig, would be leaving Newark to come to Morristown, and that the banks would be leaving Newark to come to Morristown, or Princeton, uh, and, and so forth. And uh, uh, so I, when I, I remember when I came out, Bob Matthews, who had been at Toner Crowley, <clears throat> he ultimately became the chief judge of the appellate division. But Bob told he said, Stuart, what, if you ever leave Newark, you'll never be able to come back. And he, he did that in good faith and for good reason. But what neither he nor I realized was <laughs> Newark was going to come to Morristown, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. Mm. Uh, that was a result of the 67 riots? 
I, that, that, had a, that was one of the influences. Uh, that and the interstate highway system uh, and uh, I think I think what, one of the big things was in those days banks could only branch in their home county. So if you were a bank in Newark, you could not have a branch office in Morris County. That law changed in the 1960s or 70s so that if you could, they divided the state into three banking districts and if you were within your banking district you could branch subject to regulatory approval. And then now of course it's statewide banking, international banking and so forth. But that, that I, I think the riots were, were one of the, were one of the uh, things that drove uh, folks out, uh, but there were, were other forces at work. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in the uh, interview with Eagleton that uh, banking took up a lot of your, your it did. Uh, time. It yeah. um, Was that uh, true before the, the banks and the firms came out here, or was that uh, as a result <laughs> of that? It was sort of result of, uh, a result of that. <clears throat> what happened was um, banks started to expand in part because of the change in the banking law, in part because of underlying economic forces. And if Bank A wanted to get in to the area where Bank B was, there were frequently would be a contest before whomever was the relevant regulatory authority, the comptroller of the currency or the commissioner of banking in New Jersey. And um, our firm represented, <laughs> we represented all three of the major banks in town. And so when these contested hearings came up, uh, the partner who had been doing the banking work was would ask me to do the contested hearing. And I did, I, and I did a lot of that uh, throughout the 70s. And then what happened was when these banks, uh, after, after the, after the uh, growth through mergers, I'm sorry, through expansion, through get branch banks, they then started growing through mergers and acquisitions some of the banks whom I had represented on the contested hearings were kind enough to come back to me and ask me to represent them on the mergers. And that's, uh, that was when I really shifted out of trial work into doing banking and corporate work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that, uh, this leads into something we'll get into at some point, but I knew I needed to supplement my knowledge with, with knowledge of securities law and antitrust law because those are relevant concepts in bank, banking growth. So I went up and signed up, had to be in the early 70s, I'll say 71, for a course at the Harvard Law School uh, taking antitrust law and securities law. Lo and behold, who should be up there taking a course in criminal law was Judge Brendan Byrne, who was, had been sitting in Essex. So we, we bumped into each other at a on the coffee hour, struck up a conversation. A couple of weeks later, he was named the assignment judge for the vicinage that included Morris, Sussex, and at that time, Warren counties. And through happenstance, I was the president of the County Bar Association that year. And I also had some trials, some cases before him. And that was the, the beginning of the, uh, my friendship with him. Uh, but it, it was just part of, the, part of the serendipity of life. 